the Proterozoic Eon covers an unimaginable stretch of time from 2.5 billion to 542 million years ago. The activity of photosynthetic microbes, begun in the Archean, transformed Earth into a planet with an oxygenated atmosphere and oceans. The scene was set for the subsequent evolution of life in the seas, on land, in the air. Bacteria and archaea were joined by the first simple animals and plants. Over the two billion years of the Proterozoic, continents evolved and fragmented, but left evidence in the rocks that has enabled experts to reconstruct how the globe might have looked. A world map can be pieced together by dating early mountain chains, thrown up by continental collisions and long since eroded. The continents were on the move. Ur continued to grow until 1.5 billion years ago, absorbing today's Zimbabwe, northern India, and the Yilgarn block of Western Australia. About 1.6 to 1.3 billion years ago, Arctica accreted more continental blocks to form a larger continent called Nina. A third continent, Atlantica, was formed about 2 billion years ago, adding the Tanzanian block about 1.3 billion years ago. Ur, Nina and Atlantica may have come together to form the continent of Colombia, before separating and reuniting about 1 billion year to form the supercontinent of Rodinia. This in turn split 300 million years later, opening the Panthalassic Ocean. By the end of the Proterozoic, these isolated continental blocks had rejoined in the supercontinent of Panosia. As continents were continually reshaped, the erosion of new mountain chains deposited sediments rich in minerals in the oceans. Microorganisms in the shallower seas gradually changed the composition of the atmosphere, and the end of the Proterozoic soft-bodied animals began to leave their imprints on the seafloor. Red algae on the surface of Lake Magadi, in Kenya, bear a close resemblance to Bangiomorpha, the oldest known multicellular genus in the fossil record, from a locality in Arctic Canada. The early Proterozoic was probably a little cooler than the Archean, but global temperatures may still have been around 40 degrees Celsius. They appear to have declined rapidly, resulting in a major glaciation event between 2.2 and 2.4 billion years ago. This dramatic cooling may have been triggered by the evolution of the photosynthetic cyanobacteria. After a protracted warm phase from 2.2 billion to 950 million years ago, Earth was plunged into another series of major glaciations, many of which may also have been global. Evidence for this has been found on all continents today. Glacial evidence on some continents once located in low latitudes has led to the scenario of a snowball Earth, frozen from pole to pole. Yet during the last few hundred million years of the Proterozoic, conditions were often tropical, especially at low latitudes. Intense glacial periods, perhaps for a million years, were followed by greenhouse periods when global temperatures soared. At the end of the Proterozoic, temp. aratures had returned to preglaciation levels. During the Proterozoic, evolution was almost wholly concerned with making large improvements to the cell. Such changes included the development of a nucleus, oxygenic photosynthesis, and the ability to reproduce sexually. Microfossils of this age are common in rocks called stromatolites, which are fossilized, cabbage-like growths of bacteria. They can be compared with bacteria found living today in salty lagoons and around hot springs. The cells have no nucleus or evidence for sexual reproduction and are known as prokaryotes. Some proterozoic bacteria did not need oxygen, which suggests conditions on Earth's surface were very toxic. Others resembled oxygen-producing algae called cyanobacteria. The earliest examples of these appeared around the same time as a rapid buildup of atmospheric oxygen, which made Earth far more habitable. Cells gradually became larger, and more diverse and specialized. These complex cells are called eukaryotes. The transformation of simple cells into these more advanced cells was probably the longest and greatest step in evolution. By the end of the Proterozoic, large, soft-bodied organisms were colonizing the seabed. Gunflin T is the first fossil to appear abundantly anywhere in the rock record. It was among the first oxygen-producing cyanobacteria. Photosynthetic organisms such as Gunflintia helped raise the oxygen in the atmosphere, making the Earth more habitable for later oxygen users such as protozoans, plants and animals. Fossilized Eoantophysalis occurs widely in shallow water Cherti rocks from the Proterozoic. 
It is very similar to a modern-day coccoid cyanobacterium, Antiphysalis, which can still be found in shallow, salty lagoons, they are very cosmopolitan in the way they live. This algae microfossil is seen here escaping from a round, bag-like structure called an acriterch, which helped to protect the enclosed organism from cold, drying out, or lack of oxygen. Their presence suggests the surface of the land was starting to turn green during springtime as far back as a billion years ago. Mutlicellular filaments, similar to those to modern red algae, first appeared around 1,200 million years ago. Bangiomorpha had specialized reproductive structures, and a primitive holefast that attached it to the sea floor and allowed it to rise upward toward the sunlight. The evolution of sexual reproduction and cellular differentiation can be taken as the start of the long march toward the more complex body plans of plants and animals. Modern sponges are widely agreed to be descendants of the earliest cell colonies that evolved into modern animals. The earliest fossil evidence for sponges are tiny sponge spicules, which first appeared very close to the end of the Proterozoic era. They probably evolved as protection, as well as support, during the Great Arms Race at the start of the Cambrian Explosion. Originally interpreted as green algae, these are now thought to be the eggs and embryos of early animals, or possibly the cells of sulfur-oxidine bacteria. Despite their exquisite preservation, their affinities are still debated. They may be the embryos of sponges of the Ediacara bioto, which appears just above them in Rock's record. Until 1946 the only known proterozoic fossils were layered deposits called stromatolites, which were formed by the growth of blue-green algae. However, in 1946, the Ediacaran fauna was discovered in Australia, and an entirely new perspective on the nature of the late Precambrian opened up. The late Precambrian was generally a time of simple ecosystems with short food chains, consisting of bacteria, algae and protists, which were not fossilized. It was also a time of successive glaciations, some of which were so severe that they covered the earth with ice, and gave rise to the snowball earth hypothesis. But about 580 million years ago the Ediacaran fauna began to flourish. This constituted of a diverse range of organisms in many shapes and sizes, most of which had quilted suface and lacked a gut. Over 30 genera have been identified, but opinion is still divided as to whether they are remote ancestors of modern animals, such as jellyfish, sea pens, or worms, or if they are the relics of a failed evolutionary experiment, unrelated to modern organisms, almost as though they were life from another planet. If this is the case then these vendozoa, as they are known, may have had photosynthetic algae within their tissues, or fed by absorbing nutrients across their surface. In 1957, a schoolboy, Roger Mason, found a Charnia fossil in late Precambrian rocks in Leicestershire, England. It was described a year later as a probable alga, but since then its similarity to modern sea pens, which are a type of octocoral, has generally been accepted. Another interpretation is that Charnia was a type of quilted organism that evolved in the late Precambrian, to which the general name Vendobionta is given. Charnia has a bilaterally symmetrical, feather-shaped frond with a series of side branches that remain in contact with each other along their entire length. The branches are arranged at an angle of about 45 degrees to the vertical axis. They have regular subdivisions that, if the organism were similar to a sea pen, would have housed the polyps. Some specimens have been found with a stem at the base, and in fossils of the related charniodiscus, the stem is connected to a basal disc. This example has led to the theory that the disc-shaped fossils, Aspidella and Medusinites, are the anchoring discs of charnia-like fronds. Although the fronds typically broke up when the organism died, the discs, which were already buried in the sediment, were fossilized. Recently, the suggestion that charnia was similar to sea pens has been questioned because the mode of budding at the tip of the colony appears to differ from that of modern sea pens. Cyclomedusa was found in 1946 at Ediacara in South Australia's Flinders Rages. It was one of the first Ediacaran fossils to be described. At first misidentified as a Cambrian jellyfish, it was not dated as Precambrian until the late 1950s. Today, little is known about Cyclomedusa, despite its being a common fossil. It is usually CIR. Coular with concentric ridges and radial marking. Odd-shaped specimens have been found with two or more centers, suggesting that the growth of one individual affected that of another nearby. 
When Aspidella was discovered in Canada in 1872, it was the first Precambrian fossil to be described. Later, geologists decided it was really a pseudofossil, a fossil-like impression produced by sedimentary processes. It was only after the Ediacaran faunas of Australia were described in the 1960s that Aspidella was re-examined, and geologists concluded that it was indeed a fossil. Initially classified as a jellyfish, Aspidella is now thought to have been the anchoring disk of a frond-like organism, such as Charnia. The problem with this theory is that many more disks have been found than fronds. These enigmatic fossils were first thought to be feeding trails. Their meandering nature appeared to indicate a sophisticated method of feeding, whereby an animal, often an annelid worm or a mollusk, grazes methodically over the seabed and removes surface food. However, better preserved examples of yellowvicness imply a different story. Unlike true feeding trails, there is no evidence of a turning point in the meander. Instead, the fossils appear to be collapsed, segmented tubes. It has more recently been suggested that they represent spirally organized organisms, possibly algae. Dickinsonia is one of the most perplexing fossils found in the Ediacaran fauna. At first sight it appears to be segmented, with a distinct head and tail end. This led to the belief that it was a segmented marine worm. Hundreds of examples showing all growth stages and in various types of preservation have been collected, the largest specimens known are about 1 meter in length. However, no convincing gut or other internal structures have ever been found. This has led to the conclusion that Dickinsonia fed by absorbing food through its entire undersurface. More recently, it has been suggested that this strange animal may be a pachyzoan, a group of animals that is represented by only one living species. Pachyzoans have only four types of cell, which exist in two layers. It is possible that they may be a halfway stage between sponges and eumetazoa, animals with true tissues and specialized cells. Parvancarina is an ediacaran fossil with a shield-shaped front end, which appears to be a distinct head. The body has a central axial ridge along its length and shows some evidence of segmentation. Up to 10 pairs of possible appendages have been identified on some Parvancarina fossils. Many show a distinct set of growth stages. A large number of specimens were found with their head shields facing in the direction of the water current, implying a type of feeding strategy. Tribrachidium is a mysterious Ediacaran fossil. It is a disc-shaped organism with three raised arms on its surface and a raised border. It also has a suggestion of bristle-like structures around the edge. Tribrachidium has T. Riradiate symmetry. No triradiate animals existed throughout the Phanerozoic, but it is possible that an animal with triradiate symmetry may have preceded the echinoderms, which have five-fold radial symmetry. However, Tribrachidium lacked the calcareous plates are a characteristic of echinoderms. Sprigina was a segmented animal with what appears to be a clear head and tail end. The head is horseshoe-shaped and the body consists of around 40 segments, with a prominent midline along its back and a small tail. Fossils have been found with various degrees of curvature, which shows that the body was flexible. Debate continues about what Sprigina really was. Some compare it to modern marine annelid worms, while others suggest that it could be a prototrilobite, because its head has spines that are similar to the genal spines of trilobites. For now, Sprigina is probably best placed within the bilateralia, a group that includes all animals that are bilaterally symmetrical at some point in their life cycle. Thank you. 